splintering. Beams twisting and failing. Too heavy to hold, this old house crashes to the ground. The past crushed. Somebody's memories exposed. 19th century secrets, long forgotten letters of African American refugees in Canada. caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom Mary Ann Camberton Shad. Her story is not a new one. In 1856, at the grand age of 32, she marries Thomas F. Carey in St. Catharines in Canada West, what is today Ontario. They have two children, but Thomas dies before the second is born. Mary Ann has achieved much before becoming Mrs. Carey, and she will achieve a lot more after he dies. Born in Delaware to freeborn African American parents who are influential abolitionists, she's raised to be independent and to believe in herself. Her parents moved to Pennsylvania so their children can get an education. She was the eldest child of Abraham Shad, who came to Canada. They were in Delaware and then they moved. Just about five miles, you could almost walk it. I've been to the area. Uh, into Pennsylvania, which was a free state. At age 17, Marianne leaves Pennsylvania and moves back to Delaware to teach school. At 26, she publishes the pamphlet, Hints to the Colored People of the North. When she's 27, the U.S. Congress passes the Fugitive Slave Act, placing greater constraints and even risk of enslavement on free African-Americans. The increasingly oppressive environment leads Marianne to emigrate at 28 to Canada West. Here she starts a new school in Windsor for children of all races. Nine months later, she publishes a plea for emigration or notes on Canada West for the information of colored immigrants. She quickly discovers that her strong views against black segregation and her views on black self-sufficiency differ from those of black leaders in Canada West. It is impossible to observe thoughtfully the workings of that incipient Zion, the Canadian African church of whatever denomination in its present imperfect state without seriously regretting that it should have been thought necessary to call it into existence. In her bosom is nurtured the long-standing and rankling prejudices and hatred against whites without exception that had their origin in American oppression and that should have been left in the country in which they originated. Marianne is strongly opposed to black segregation in churches and schools. She's also strongly opposed to charity for blacks, believing in the importance of black self-sufficiency. In particular, she falls into a dispute with an African-American who, like herself, recently immigrated to Canada. He is local black newspaper publisher, community leader, and former slave, Henry Bibb. He uses his newspaper, The Voice of the Fugitive, to publicly disparage her views. As a consequence, her school loses funding and closes in 1853. But Marianne is not a person easily defeated. She launches her own newspaper, 
the provincial freeman. She started out teaching in Windsor, and apparently um, she didn't like what she saw as far as what the Bibbs and others were uh, getting involved in with the Refugee Home Society and begging for funds uh, around North America to sustain this um, agricultural scheme. And uh, that's how um, you know her animosity and her rift with the Bibbs and uh, his allies uh, began. And um, I think that's when she realized uh, that having her own paper to be able to disseminate uh, her viewpoints um, would be a really valuable thing to, to uh, engage in. She spends a tremendous amount of time raising money for the Provincial Freeman, as well as writing for and running the newspaper. Reverend Mr. Ward, sir, Mr. and Mrs. William Still write that you are in debt, two letters, and they wish, if you think proper, a reply to Johnson's letter. My dear Shad, your kind letter of the 10th is before me. Mr. John Brown of Hamilton will please pay to write Reverend... Mrs. M.A.S. Carey, I take the opportunity of writing these few lines, hoping they will find you in good health. She has a busy family life, too, and part of her responsibilities include family correspondence when she can find the time. Dear brother, I heard you were in Buffalo. I have not time to... My dear Marianne, I was struck panic on looking over the standard of last Saturday to see it in... Dear T, enclosed, please find a letter that came today for you. One hundred and ten years pass. In 1974, the former home of Mary Ann Shad Carey crashes to the ground. Only later do the owners, her descendants, realize what lies inside. Well, I'm a great, 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 great grand nephew about that long ago, so that would be the connection, the family connection. Probably. The first we heard about her was when we started finding those letters that were addressed to her. And as it turned out, uh, the story is that Mary Ann Shad Carey lived in the house that we purchased. And that because she lived there for a while, some of her papers had been left there upstairs in the attic. We never ventured beyond the second floor into the attic. And the letters and various items were found between the beams, apparently. They had just sort of been there, collected dust. Mice had chewed into some of the letters. And we didn't know any of this history until we found the letters. I was looking for old wood. And so I thought, oh, we have this torn out house right across the lane. So I went over there, and as I looked, I came across a letter. I couldn't resist taking it out and looking at it. And it was written by a young girl to a relative back in Buxton. And she was talking about buying shoes and someone had a cold. And it was intriguing. Dear Grandma, I have received your letter some time ago and I am glad to hear from you. I should have wrote sooner but was not very well. Everybody has been sick with a cold. Mama had the toothache all last week. We are getting along very poorly. I need shoes and Papa has not got enough money to buy any with. Mama said that she sends her love and would have wrote but had nothing interesting to write about. As you are so busy, answer when you can make it convenient. Please answer soon. Your loving granddaughter. So I mentioned it to Ed. We mentioned it to his brother and his wife who lived also on the same road next, to, next door. His sister and her husband. And everyone, we would spend hours over there digging through, trying to find 
whatever was available, but there were so many things that were buried because the house had been torn down by using a tractor and just pulling right. the studs out, I guess, mm -hmm. and things have just sort of crumpled in 1974. But if only we had known that those things were up in the attic. Have... You know, mm -hmm. we would have gotten, I'm sure, so many more letters and so forth, but we had no idea. Never went up there, had no need. So our cultural heritage is very fragile. Photographic negatives from the 1950s are particularly sensitive. Um, cellulose, uh, diacetate-based uh, photography, uh, uh, cellulose nitrate is probably the most famous uh, volatile photographic substrate. Um, thinking about movie houses that burnt down because of overheated uh, film projectors, um, that's probably the most extreme of examples. I. Um, did research, as you know, on Hamilton, and um, there was a, a man who uh, was a slave, and he escaped and came to Canada West, and he was able to, at some point, um, buy a house and property, and in his will, one of the things he left his second wife was a group of photographs. Um, but where those photographs are now, we will never know, but, you know, as a researcher, you just love to be able to have those photographs of him, um, but we don't have them. And so you imagine that they were thrown out at some point, and it's, it's just really, <laughs> you know, it just, it's tragic at, on some level, uh, because you, you want to know what this person looked like and, you know, see, see him, but you're, you're not able to. Sometimes, though, gaps in the archival record came not from losses, but from the fact that the historical narratives were never recorded or weren't saved. Most, uh, many black people were not very literate, and people who were not literate could not leave uh, a written legacy. They didn't write in diaries, they didn't send letters, so it, you know, it would be difficult um, to know what was going on in any, in any given family if nobody wrote anything down and left it for posterity. So, I mean, we as researchers, we uh, look at the, the uh, archival documents like the census and the city directories and, you know, the, uh, all of those kinds of things that kind of help us or pinpoint where people were and what they jobs they might have been engaged in and things like that, but to know like the inner life of a person, their thoughts and feelings, it's very difficult to, to know that because uh, many people simply could not leave that kind of information behind. And uh, you know, another thing is uh, people didn't think that was important enough to save and so a lot of it got uh, thrown out over time. At times, however, gaps in the archival record resulted from the fact that the records were never collected within the archive. Much of black history in Canada was ignored until the 1960s and 1970s and did not gain real traction until the 1980s. In 1981, the U.S. Black Abolitionist Papers Project was started resulting in an annotated collection of archival papers concerning black history in the U.S. and Canada. Library and Archives Canada collected archival material with some black content in the early part of the 20th century. However, it was not until the 1980s that it began actively collecting black documentary history. One exception to this collection pattern was the Shad Family Papers. Library and Archives Canada began collecting her family's papers in 1960. The Marianne Shad letters that were discovered in the demolition rubble near Chatham were collected and stabilized at the Archives of Ontario in 1974. It's often a business of, of opportunity and uh, the, the absence of certain narratives isn't necessarily a reflection on the lack of interest. In, in the acquisition of narratives, but uh, certainly uh, with the uh, 
uh, burgeoning uh, social history movements and the, uh, the emergence of uh, Black History Month and other uh, promotions uh, amongst other cultural groups in Ontario and celebrating their own history, uh, more, more records started to come uh, to light and become available. And, and we are conscious to try not to just cater to the research interests of the day. And there's some, been some very key examples of that. Um, probably the most notable example of the subject files of the Ministry, uh, sorry, sorry, the Department of Health um, in the 1960s were moving house and uh, the person who was responsible for looking after these records came, took it upon themselves to select the records from there, and this is the 60s, uh, to determine what records they thought would have long-term value. and for some reason that is bizarre to us today, they didn't select ones on women's health and didn't select ones on so many topics today that we would find fascinating that we would, not, what would want to preserve. But in, in the case of black history, I think a lot of uh, the 19th and 18th century material started to come to light during the civil rights and the black power movement. And we saw uh, a lot of um, text uh, written in the 19th century, uh, like slave narratives, being republished by, uh, you know, presses in the 60s and 70s. I, I think that was a, a big spur, the uh, civil rights and black power movements in the 60s and 70s. These stories are not in the history books. Let's face that. Uh, and so it's up to us who have researched them and working hard to do it, tell the stories, and the stories are wonderful. It was indeed a lucky coincidence that Mary Ann Shad's letters were found in the pile of rubble from the house before it was burned. But perhaps even more profoundly, it's fortunate that they were not found until the 1970s. Had the letters been found in the 1940s or 50s, they may not have even been offered to the archives. Equally, they might not have been accepted by the archives. After all, they were not artifacts for remembering the heroic narratives of important white men. They were artifacts recalling the life of a person who was black and a woman. But with the emergence in the 1960s of ideas about social history, the history of ordinary people, the civil rights movement, and women's history, all at once, these sorts of artifacts were seen as important. Mary Ann Shad's letters were perfect materials for this new archival paradigm. They responded to new ideas among historians about the diversity of the past and its people. They were exactly what archives of the time were seeking. She was black, she was a woman, and she was impressive. Mary Ann Shad to me was one of those well-respected women, but she was before her time. She was, you know, uh, tenacious. She was frank. You know, she was courageous. Um, she was witty. She was strong-willed. Um, you know, she was scholarly. Um, she had all those great characteristics. I think that made her very, very unique. And uh, and I think that sort of assisted her in her uh, per while while she pursued her various careers, um, you know, being the editor of the newspaper. But she was one of those women that wouldn't stand down um, for anything. You know, she would not back away because she firmly, she had so many beliefs, you know, self-reliance is the true road to independence, uh, didn't believe in segregation. And here she was, a mother trying to raise a family, living away from her, her husband. You know, that was <laughs> a big deal back then traveling all over the countryside, and she was out there in a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Ward, sir, Robinson Bush has withdrawn from the committee in my favor as he cannot often meet with the rest. When will the convention spoken of here come off in London? Would it not be stupid for black ladies in Canada to unite with those in the States in an address to England? Louis Tappet writes me for such a thing. Would it not be a separation from the anti-slavery body here? Respectfully, sir, M.A. Shad. Mrs. Curry, dear Shad, 
Regarding the provincial freemen of 28 March, if you allow such nicety of feeling to guide you, so as by it that the plain truth be concealed, you may as well shut up your office. Let the truth be told in decent language, and it will carry conviction some way or other, and be fearless. But this collection of Mary Ann's letters is perhaps even more important because it reveals personal details of her life not found anywhere else. They show the challenges of moving away from family in Delaware and the difficulties of having her husband, Thomas Carey, working in Toronto while Mary Ann takes care of their family 300 kilometers away in Chatham. Dear wife, if you please, I want you to write me a long letter so that I will get it on Sunday morning and it will be food for me on that day. Wilmington, January 18, 1858. My dear Mary Ann, some time ago I wrote to you concerning Mrs. Vesey and requested an answer, but none has ever come. If you remember, I told you that she was a fugitive. She lives in continual dread and wants to come to Canada. Toronto, Canada West, September 16, 1851. Dear brother, I have been here more than a week and like Canada. Do not feel prejudice and think, if you were to come here, you would do well. This letters collection also reveals the close personal nature of some of her business relationships. This kind of close professional friendship is particularly evident in her correspondence from black American abolitionist William Still. Dear friend, though I wrote you last, I cannot resist the temptation to write you again. I often think about you and feel anxious to know how you are getting on. You may readily imagine, therefore, how highly gratifying and how thankfully received a long letter from you would be. Why does Mary Ann save these letters and then leave them behind in Canada when she returns to the U.S.? In 1863, Mary Ann leaves Canada. She returns to the U.S. to recruit black soldiers for the Civil War. It is a critical moment for the cause of abolition in the United States. President Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. The war will determine the future of four million enslaved people. This is the moment her family has worked towards. It is the moment everyone in the abolitionist community has worked for. Mary Ann throws all her energies into it and her children come along with her. This is who she is. By the 1960s, Mary Ann Shad Carey is already known to some. She stands out as a woman who has made an impression in a man's world. Some of her professional papers are collected by Library and Archives Canada, but it is not until 1974 when, by chance, her personal letters rise from the rubble of her old house that we see the private side of Mary Ann Shad. And we are interested, because by 1974, times have changed, and we with them. 